Good evening, everyone. I trust you are all doing very well. Welcome to the fourth episode of Scientifically Speaking Season 5. This is an interactive online lecture series that aims to connect high school students, teachers, principals, and anyone who's keen to learn with interdisciplinary scientists uh, exploring real world problems. So this is the fifth season of Scientifically Speaking. And over the last four seasons, we have covered unique and contemporary scientific topics ranging from digital health to astronomy, origins of life to astrophysics, animal behavior to infectious diseases. My name is Yukti and I'll be your host for today's session. With a training in uh, chemistry, I completed my PhD from TIFR Mumbai and subsequently pursued a career in science communication. At Ashoka, I oversee the academic communications efforts and I look forward to guiding you through a captivating session. Now I'll quickly introduce our speaker for today. We have with us Professor Manvi Sharma. She's the Faculty of Environmental Studies at Ashoka University. She's a behavioral ecologist studying how different traits in predators and prey contribute to diversity and how these interactions play out in a changing environment. Manvi received her PhD from the Center for Ecological Sciences at the Indian Institute of Sciences, Bangalore. Subsequently, she pursued her postdoctoral research at the Nature Conservation Foundation, Bangalore. She is deeply interested in the Himalayan landscapes, the human nature relationships in these fragile mountain ecosystems, and the part that snow leopards play in these relationships. She is interested in uh, using interdisciplinary approaches to uh, sort of understand and manage carnivore and human relationships in the Indian Himalaya. Uh, Manvi has also worked with the Snow Leopard Trust, A3, and various depart government departments and uh, local communities in the Spiti Valley in the in Himachal Pradesh on assessment of how snow leopard population on uh, snow leopard populations and how and and she has been working extensively towards their conservation. In today's session, Manvi will delve into the unique distribution of snow leopards exclusively found in 12 countries. She will talk, uh, her talk will revolve around the intricate dynamics of animal environment interactions, uh, shedding light on the factors that influence whether a population faces extinction or if uh, an invasive species will proliferate in a particular region. Uh, so without further ado, let's get started. I will request our audience to kindly type any questions that you may have in the Q&A box provided on your Zoom screen, and we'll address them towards the end of the session. On that note, a very warm welcome to you, Manvi. Over to you. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Yukti. And uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it gives me great joy, you know, to join you today and reach out to young school students um, to talk about some of the research that I do here at Ashoka University. So uh, as you can guess from the poster, I'm going to be talking about the snow leopards today. So let me just quickly share my screen so that you can see uh, the spectacular uh, uh, photographs that I have. Yes, I hope you can see my screen uh, now. Yes. yes. Right. So what I call fantastic beasts, um, and, and I'm going to argue that they are no less than the magical creatures uh, of the wizardry world, right, are the predators uh, in the ecosystem. These predators sit at the top of the food chain, right? So what we need to first ask is why why are predators so important why do they sit at the top of a food chain right why does it matter why does a predator matter so much well um wildlife biologists did not think so um uh, some time ago so let me take you to um uh, about 19 you know in, until 1960s uh, many decades ago wildlife biologists thought that many different species all of them have to play an important uh, equally important role in the food chain uh, meaning that if you if a, if an ecosystem is filled with many many species if it's very diverse it's okay if once if we lose out on one species the ecosystem will still remain stable 
and biodiverse right so all species play an equally important role in a food chain in in an ecosystem when i say ecosystem you can think of a mountain ecosystem which um, may have a snow leopard uh, ungulates like uh, blue sheep and uh, ibex and grasses as the vegetation right or you can also think of marine ecosystems um with uh, sharks at the top and fish and uh, coral reefs as well right um but in the 1960s what ecologists asked and one uh, pioneering ecologist robert pain he asked if some species are more important right and he wanted to test if predators are more important in the functioning of an ecosystem uh, he studied these uh, beautiful intertidal communities um, where starfish are the top predators and you have many barnacles uh, mussels whelks and uh, limpets uh, subsequently which form the part of the food chain what he did he carefully removed only the starfish from some sites which he called the experimental site and in the control site he kept the ecosystem intact and what he found was surprising it was very surprising for all ecologists at that time which was if he removed only the primary the main predator the whole community changed it became dominated only by the muscles right he called these um, important predatory species as keystone species and what um, ecologists started appreciating then was that some species uh, some fantastic beasts right are more important than others when they are um, maintaining the function of an ecosystem um these species which he called the keystone species if you remove them from the ecosystem you will have cascading effects across different trophic levels in the whole ecosystem right and this idea of an of a keystone species of a flagship species became very important you can imagine uh, why right if you are able to conserve and work towards protection of these keystone species then you could have protection for ecosystem for entire ecosystems right and this idea became very popular uh, amongst ecologists and you um, you'd see that much of game reserve management uh, protected area management in sub saharan africa actually depends on management of lion populations their translocations between different game reserves even back in india you will notice that uh, much of our landscape management protected area management is centered around this charismatic um, apex predator right the tiger one uh, such um, charismatic secret elusive a uh, predator of the mountain ecosystems is the enigmatic snow leopard right so when you want to work towards conservation of this snow leopard you need to find out the first thing that comes to your mind is to know where this predator lives right where uh, what are its habitats and if as a scientist as a researcher if you want to answer this question or generally speaking if you want to answer questions you have to think of um ideas to test right which we in our scientific parlance we call hypotheses so you have a question in mind and you want to think of different hypotheses that you want to test to answer this question now let's imagine that one hypothesis that you have is that snow leopards like to be they like to live in areas where densities of their prey which which is the blue sheep or the ibex are high so wherever prey and prey populations are healthy the snow leopard will be found there um this this photograph shows the blue sheep and in the background you can see the beautiful uh, uh, snow covered spiti valley 
Um, blue sheep, interestingly, is neither blue nor sheep. It's it's a double misnomer. The local people call it bharal, which is, I think, the more appropriate uh, name for it, the bharal. So maybe snow leopards are found in areas where bharal are found, right? Or um, maybe snow leopards uh, pay attention to human uh, settlements, right? They Because we know that there is conflict between herders and snow leopards and uh, sometimes there can be retaliatory attacks on snow leopards maybe snow leopards select and only those areas where human habitations um, is less is less intense right or a third working hypothesis could be that it's, it's something about the habitat uh, feature, the terrain of uh, the landscape. And snow leopards choose those areas where you find more cliffs, right? You can have um, uh, valleys, slopes, you can have different ruggedness in, in the terrain. And maybe snow leopards like to be in those areas where you have sharp cliffs. For some reason, they like to be you know, uh, hidden in, in these crevices, right? So as a researcher now, if you want to um, test these three different ideas, you want to uh, collect information on snow leopard presence and then compare the evidence uh, which you get for each of these three ideas, right? So, um, but how do you even how do you how do you even study uh, the snow leopard right how do you study such uh, an elusive species right which is you know active only during dawn and dusk and uh, these landscapes are sometimes very harsh where at night the temperatures can go below minus 20 degrees so how 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 can you be out there uh, to study this um, uh, seemingly difficult to study species so uh, here, uh, technology can come handy, and what we use are these um, motion sensing camera traps. So I happen to have a camera trap with me right now, so I thought I can I can just show you what it looks like. So they have these infrared beams, which you know, which when get disrupted, um, then they take a photograph, right? And they also come with a flash and um, you can get beautiful uh, photographs uh, even at night. Um, to operate the camera, you need to um, place, um, you know, you need to place uh, a memory card and you need to give uh, information. You can set it up and you need to uh, place lots of batteries, which you need to also uh, go and change frequently. So the cameras can be left um, at suitable locations for maybe a month and um, then you can you know retrieve the uh, memory card and or change the memory card if you want to keep the cameras for longer and change the batteries um, we did one such exercise and uh, um, I wanted to quickly sh uh, show you what this map means. Uh, this is the state boundary of the Indian uh, state of Himachal Pradesh. And um, what uh, I did with my team from uh, Snow Leopard Trust Nature Conservation Foundation, we set up camera traps along the entire uh, greater and trans Himalayan region in Himachal Pradesh. And here each red dot is a camera trap location where snow leopards were found. And I think you can, and the green maps, these green blocks are protected areas of Himachal Pradesh. And just by a quick look, I think you can tell that snow leopards like to be not so much inside protected areas, right? They, they like to be the um, outside um, the protected area as much as uh, they are inside the protected area. But um, uh, let's let's um, look at what we get. Let's uh, from these camera traps. We get these um, beautiful photographs, which really tell us so much about the snow leopard. Right? They tell the each 
camera trap image tells us about the time at which the photograph was clicked so you can tell when the snow leopard is likely to be active right it tells us the location of um, where the photograph was taken and the most important thing is that it um, it can the whole image you can look at it carefully and analyze the rosette patterns on its uh, flank on its face on its tail and compare one image with another image uh, what this helps you um, in doing is that you can uniquely identify each snow leopard because just like how we have fingerprints snow leopards have unique rosette patterns so by this information and by comparing images i can tell whether one snow leopard is you know um is re getting recaptured in nearby camera traps and has you know which means that it might have formed a territory here or if a snow leopard is getting detected the same snow leopard is getting detected in far away cameras i can tell that it's actually dispersing right so camera trap images are a storehouse of information um Along with, while camera traps are used for studying snow leopards, to study the blue sheep, the bharal, and uh, um, the mountain ibex, what you need to use are these, you know, uh, the favorite uh, tool of any ecologist, you have to use binoculars. So using binoculars, you can walk along um, the ridges of the mountains and scan the whole landscape to count um the the blue sheep you can also you know depending on the horn length uh coat color you can also tell whether it's a male or a female blue sheep how young the blue sheep is so you can get a lot of information uh, by just observing and being um, in the wild so coming back to the question we were interested in asking if uh, prey are important for um, the snow leopard, right? The snow leopard like to be in areas where prey densities are high. And this is what we found actually, that in areas where prey densities are higher, snow leopard densities are likely to be higher, right? So if you can look at this um, uh, uh, graph very quickly, Spiti and Tabo and Hangrang have some of the highest densities of prey and snow leopard. But um, Bharmor and Chandra here on the left, down left, have lower densities of both prey and also the snow leopard. Right. Um, and, you know, when we were uh, uh, doing this camera trapping survey, we actually um, had to work um, in about 20,000 square kilometers of Himachal Pradesh. So wanted, I wanted to say that it's, it's, um, it was a huge effort by a large team, not just me. Um, and the team was uh, from this uh, village in the Spiti Valley, Kibbar. And every evening we would, um, you know, look at the camera traps and when uh, camera trap images and whenever uh, a snow leopard photograph would um, appear uh, you know sometimes you can see the snow leopard scratching its back or marking its territory you know the whole village would come together to rejoice that there's um, a snow leopard uh, uh, in uh, in the in, in the nearby area right but all interactions were not rejoiced right because snow leopards also enter the corrals um, of these villagers. Corals are these enclosures where people keep their livestock and snow leopards um, are known to go attack the livestock. So they, in fact, come to the villages, enter the corals and kill livestock, right? So from our conversations um, with the villagers, we found that, you know, we, we, we tracked it and we found that livestock killing is is not a one-off event it's something that's part of of the snow leopard's life consistently across uh, a decade of uh, measuring this um, the snow leopard trust 
uh, and Nature Conservation Foundation's team, they have found that um, snow leopards uh, consistently kill livestock, right? So now if, if we want to uh, work towards snow leopard conservation and we know that to maintain snow leopard populations, we need to maintain um, wild ungulate populations, uh, which is the blue sheep and the mountain ibex. But this is confusing, right? This is a puzzle. Um, if we are, if we think that we are able to uh, keep a healthy prey population, then snow leopard populations will be healthy. But this throw, threw us off, right? Um, that they uh, continue to uh, attack uh, livestock as well. So to understand this, the question that we now need to know, we now need to answer is what the snow leopard eats, not just where it lives, but what a snow leopard eats, right? And you can imagine for uh, an elusive, uh, rare, um, secretive species, this can be a very challenging task, right? Um, how How is it um, even possible to observe the snow leopard uh, attack and eat? Uh, and how can we collect more data? Again, there, is, there are tricks to answer these questions, right? Um, the, the trick is the uh, that you analyze the scat, the poop of the snow leopard. Again, the poop of the snow leopard is a storehouse of information. Um, by carefully collecting uh, the scat from different kinds of regions, you can ask very interesting questions about what the snow leopard eats, right? And now there are these um, sophisticated uh, eDNA meta barcoding um, tools which you can use to find out uh, whether the DNA found in the scat matches uh, the blue sheep or does it match the livestock, right? Or other smaller prey which the snow leopard might eat like, like pika or marmots, right? Uh, and of course, you will have um, in the snow leopard poop, you're also likely to see the snow leopard DNA as well. And this information can also be used to uniquely identify each snow leopard, like how we did for the camera traps. So um, um, this kind of information has been used to study snow leopard diets. And we know that um, snow leopards eat lots of different livestock, right? They eat, um, they can eat um, even within the protected area or outside the protected area. They can eat goat, sheep, donkey, horse, uh, yak, cattle variants, right? So their diet is, um, you know, very wide and wild ungulates here, um, which is the ibex uh, and bharal, they form a large part of their diet, but they um, also tend to eat a lot of livestock. So now if we want to think of uh, snow leopard conservation, we need to think of maintaining healthy prey populations. But at the same time, we also need to work towards protection of the livestock of herders, right? So. Um, by asking these questions, these two questions that I told you about, um, we can uh, think of uh, conservation interventions. One such conservation intervention is setting aside these grazing free pastures. So these landscapes have, um, you know, these vast pastures where both the livestock of the herders and the wild ungulates, which are the main prey of the snow leopard, they um, graze and they browse together. And they're often in intense competition for resources, right? But by setting aside uh, some pastures where livestock are not allowed to graze, um, there you can maintain a healthy population of these wild ungulates. So that's one intervention which um, uh, um, the Nature Conservation Foundation did. 
uh, and this program is now being run for a very long time and it's completely community managed it's something that is uh, led and decided by the local herders now in fact they take duties in guarding and they take pride in um guarding these uh, grazing free pastures and and they completely decide which area to set aside as a pasture so the um the impact of this intervention is that it will help towards maintaining uh, ungulate populations now you can imagine that if you have healthy ungulate populations um what will happen to the snow leopard populations it's likely to increase right because more prey means more snow leopards this might also mean that there's going to be more livestock depredation right so the other thing which the other intervention which the uh, which my team did was this corral reinforcement so the corrals that the locals have the traditional corrals are usually these um you know rock uh, piled up rocks which form an enclosure and they are not uh, covered by any uh, they don't have a roof basically so the snow leopard can easily enter the corral and and unfortunately even if the snow leopard uh, attacks only a few one or two um of their sheep uh, many many sometimes all of the sheep die of shock so the it's a big loss to the herder so what the uh, team does they provide a, a reinforcement they provide a proper roof so that these corals become predator proof right mm -hmm. so uh, you can imagine that sometimes um, and it was this was a, a great joy that sometimes you had binoculars in your hands sometimes you had uh, a camera trap in your hand but many times you also had a hammer and a chisel uh, and these rocks in your hands to uh, make these corals uh, predator proof so uh, just wanted to summarize i know i have only a few minutes what i wanted to show you through um, this interaction uh, is that using uh, um, this idea of these two questions right where the snow leopard lives and what the snow leopard eats and uh, also tying back to the first question of why predators are important right um, by using this re uh, research based um, hypothesis based approach you can actually find answers which can help you in thinking about solutions right it can help you in thinking about um, solutions to these uh, problems of um, um, human animal uh, coexistence and uh, often some uh, often conflict so um, just wanted to uh, leave you with this beautiful uh, uh, snow leopard painting so uh, i hope uh, i hope you uh, get inspired uh, to take up such research projects as well. Wow, thank you so much, Manvi. This was such an enlightening session. I think the work is superb. It's so exciting and we already have uh, questions coming in. So if uh, you allow, I can just start with the uh, question and answers. Sure. Yeah. So, okay. So the first question is someone is asking about the camera trap, like what is the criteria for placing the camera track, uh, camera trap, sorry. Yeah. So a very good question. Uh, you, you, uh, to decide where to place the camera, you actually have to do some preliminary surveys, right? And we were immensely helped by the local people uh, from from the landscapes um, so you need to maximize snow leopard detection uh, for that uh, it's best that you place these cameras where you already have some signs of you know scratching or sometimes we found scats or uh, urine marks so we we've tried to um, use these signs to place our camera traps and also uh, at the microhabitat level, uh, we we decide to place these cameras in you know closer to cliffs, 
um, and sharp valleys so that we we get um, snow leopard detections sure sure all right thank you and uh, the follow up question is how many camera traps were set in the himalayan region where you were conducting your research yeah so in um, himachal pradesh there were 284 locations um where we put these camera traps um but the red dots that i showed you those were only the dots where snow leopards were detected yeah but the total locations were 284 okay okay sure thank you uh, so the next question is manvi about uh, the flash that you mentioned does the flash not bring leopards attention to the camera snow leopards attention to the camera have you seen situations where the uh, camera was damaged by uh, the predator and also are these infrared cameras these are two questions yes so um yes these cats are very very curious sometimes we you know um, we program these cameras to take 5 6 rapid um uh, uh, shots and you can see that the snow leopard comes very close to the camera and um, you know tries to look at it from different angles so that that has happened um um but we we think that uh, the flash is not too strong for it to uh, get bothered because it just doesn't seem to dissuade the the snow leopard it, it just stays there and you know examines it for a long time um yes these are uh, uh, infrared cameras and um, the specific model is reconix hyperfire 2 you can uh, look them up um, uh, um yeah, this this is the model that i used but there are several models which different models which uh, researchers um, use we haven't had a case of completely you know um a camera being damaged by uh, snow leopards but um in other areas uh, in lahol for example where you have these himalayan brown bears um they tend to damage the camera uh, that has uh, happened before yes but snow leopards uh, did not damage the camera for uh, our study sites thank you someone is asking have your camera traps ever been stolen during this exercise <laughs> yes that uh, that happens um it didn't happen so much to us because as part of this project we also went to each village and uh before doing the survey we told the people that look we're setting up these camera traps in 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 these landscapes and um uh, this is how the camera trap works this is the goal of the project it's not for tracking people right so these sorts of uh, um workshops are also actually aimed at encouraging more local people in joining us uh, for setting up these cameras so um we've actually not had so many just one or two incidents of a camera trap being stolen over so many years of doing field work here uh, i think the key really is to engage with with the people okay uh, all right the next question is how many snow leopards live in the spiti valley and do we have snow leopards <coughs> at any other location in india and how is it different from uh, other countries <laughs> yeah so snow leopards are found in 12 uh, range countries and uh, their largest habitat is in china uh, followed by mongolia and then the third largest habitat is in india um within india uh, we it's found in five states these um, himalayan states um we don't have a, a single count for the entire in indian um, you know for for all of india but some states have already completed these counts himachal pradesh was one of the first states to 
complete the count um, ladakh uh, uttarakhand arunachal pradesh sikkim uh, um, all of these states are uh, you know uh, completing their efforts now some states have already published uh, these results uh, interestingly even in kashmir uh, there was a detection of um, a snow leopard recently so it's i think it's, it's a very exciting time to study these populations nice very nice all right uh, uh this brings us to the next question someone is asking do snow leopards breed in captivity well yes um uh, there are many snow leopards in zoos and uh, they do successfully breed in captivity um, i think there are about 600 snow leopards globally across um, um the world in many different zoos and um yeah i don't know if the 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 number of cubs is comparable to the one uh, ones in the wild but uh, successfully snow leopards do breed in zoos okay all right thank you uh the next question is how are snow leopards genetically related or unrelated to forest leopards uh the common leopard uh yes. i think um is the question so snow leopard is uh, also one of the big cats right it's the scientific name is panthera panthera ansia and it's it is related to these um, other cats but their habitat of the common leopard and the snow leopard is um, not very similar it's, it's usually it's considered uh, uh, to be very different right because snow leopards are found only in the higher mountains above tree line typically um, you know uh, in india for example above 2000 meters of elevation um, but increasingly there have been um, uh, some stories about snow leopard and the common leopard habitat um, overlapping so it's uh, exciting to see whether um, it's the common leopards home range if that's increasing uh, and overlapping with the snow leopard uh, uh, range or is the snow leopard coming down we we don't know that yeah okay all right sure uh manvi someone is asking what inspired you to study the lives of snow leopards and uh, do you also plan to sort of translate the findings of this research to study any other big cat um well i uh, i think it's it was a very happy accident uh, that i i got a chance to work with the snow leopard trust before this i was working with other cool uh, predators i've always been interested in these predator prey interactions uh, and some of the other model systems that i study in um, my research are dragonflies uh, from the peninsular india which are i think super cool and super fascinating as well um about other big cats well i don't know but i i do want to study these other carnivores that go occur with snow leopards you know like the common leopard or the himalayan brown bear or the smaller and meso carnivores like uh, the red fox uh, these yellow throated martens which are these beautiful um, arboreal carnivores which you know which 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 this all of these form a very diverse mountain uh, carnivore community and we don't know uh, much about them at all so are there other groups manvi who are sort of studying the uh, this domain or uh, uh, are they yet to be explored uh, well the snow leopard the trust has many projects uh, they have one project in mongolia um, and they have been studying snow leopard populations for quite some time and they have also come up with a country wide assessment of uh, you know how many snow leopards are there Mm-hmm. in mongolia um uh, in india as well the snow leopard trust through nature conservation foundation uh, has projects in uh, himachal pradesh um, um and uh, ladakh and and uh, jammu and kashmir um, um i think um these these two groups um are uh, really leading the snow leopard uh, work okay Thank you. 
so uh, all right now next question is about it's a career question so how can students get involved in wildlife research and what is the ideal career trajectory that they should pursue right so there are several um, masters programs in india now uh, there um, you know you can uh, look up wildlife institute of india uh, they offer a master's program in wildlife biology um, there is uh, ncbs in bangalore they offer a master's program uh, in wildlife biology and conservation um, there are uh, uh, there is center for ecological sciences at iisc they also have a master's in life sciences program with a focus on ecology and wildlife biology so i think um, uh, several um, um, universities are now putting uh, more importance on uh, climate change ecology evolution environment um, as you know important courses to take even at ashoka university we have um, many different um, uh, departments which uh, which teach courses um, on animal behavior, like I take a course on animal behavior. Uh, my colleagues teach ecology uh, and evolution. So we also have a whole uh, suite of courses that you can take. Uh, but if you want to, um, uh, you know, take a more, um, if you're asking me at the undergraduate level, there are many, uh, Ashoka University has many courses. Uh, at master's level, I mentioned those two places um that you know uh, wildlife institute of india and ncps sure sure thank you so next up is uh, uh is a question where someone talks about the ethical ethics and policies in place so what measures are being taken by the government of india for conservation of such species do we have any uh, set uh, set of policies in place? Like someone is someone is really uh, keen on talking about uh, sacrificing the prey population uh, to increase the population of the snow leopard. So I think it's a research ethics question that one needs to discuss. Mm, well, I maybe I've. <coughs> Some of it I didn't understand because if you sacrifice the prey population, in fact, it will negatively affect the snow leopard population, right? Because what will the snow leopard eat, to put it very simply, right? So, um, well, um, we have these laws. We have the Wildlife Protection Act. And then at the management level, uh, the Himachal Pradesh Forest Department, and I'm sure several other forest departments, work closely um, on landscape management plans with the local people and with researchers to um, you know to to encourage uh, snow leopard conservation so that that uh, happens through uh, engaging with the forest department directly yeah also i think uh, uh, it it's time to mention that there there are no manipulations from the researchers and uh, as far as the experiment is being conducted it's just the observation that takes you to the uh, data and then you further analyze it and conclude, uh, like you get your uh, conclusions there is no sort of stimulation from your end as uh, as far as the research experiment is con uh, concerned Yes. So all the uh, research work that I spoke about today, it was non-invasive. We did not capture a snow leopard at all. Um, and, you know, these, these cameras are just stationary um, and they just record data. So like Yukti mentioned, it is uh, a completely non-invasive method and no animals are handled or captured or manipulated. Thanks, Manvi. So uh, next up, uh, someone is uh, talking about the error bars in the data. So as there is low number, as there are low, there's low number of snow leopards, there is bound to be lower amount of data and also more variations in data relating to individual traits. Given this, how should one conduct research so that they come to a strong and empirical conclusion? Yeah, I think uh, the problem of having these large error bars 
uh, I think if uh, um, one one favorite thing which all statisticians you uh, love to say is that you need to add more data to improve your certainty on your estimates, right? And um, uh, some of um, so some of the ways of improving data are, uh, you know, we, we have, uh, for example, for our camera trap images, um, uh, we manually compare each image, right? Uh, um, and it can also lead, although we, we do the image comparison um, three times and we get it reviewed by um, other experts as well, there is scope for more you know maybe using ai based tools to work on um, some of these image comparison uh, uh, kind of data which can then improve our you know reduce our errors of misidentification and and then in turn lead to increased uh, accuracy in, in increased or or you can say reduced uh, uncertainty in measuring the uh, estimates yeah. sure okay uh, uh, Aman, with the next question is again a career question where uh, someone wants to know if a non-science stream student can also get involved in re, uh, in uh, wildlife research. Right. So um, uh, I don't know at what career level you are right now, but um, uh, maybe and um, I'm sure you can have a detailed conversation with. Uh, Yukti also at some point about this, but at Ashoka we have uh, a major and minor uh, model. So you can take science courses with humanities. So it's you can you know sometimes study um, the politics of conservation and you can study the ecology uh, the ecology angle of um, uh, uh, a conservation problem as well. So you. Um, at the undergraduate level at Ashoka, you can combine these uh, very different sciences and humanities courses uh, to form your major and minor. Um, and uh, again, at um, some of my colleagues, uh, and in fact, I've also had a very, um, you know, like a meandering uh, journey. I did a microbiology bachelor's, and then I moved on to um, uh, animal behavior and wildlife ecology. So um, I think the important thing is to uh, find out what um, keeps you, you know, excited and what keeps you um, uh, very um, motivated and, and passionate about the questions that you're uh, interested in yeah yeah so uh, i i totally agree with manvi there is no straight line that needs to be followed you really need to and it's best if you really uh, try and explore the uh, territory which is yet to be explored because that's where most of the uh, excitement lies otherwise most of the things are now con getting conventional so, um, uh, Manvi, this brings us to the next question where someone wants to know um, about the lifespan of snow leopard. How many years does a snow leopard live for? And also, if you could talk about the running speed of this and compare it to the normal leopards, like the forest leopards. Okay. So, um, in the zoo, uh, some estimates about snow leopard lifespans are, uh, you know, up to uh, 20 years. So, so in, in captivity, snow leopards can live a very long life. But in the wild, the estimates are around, you know, 10 to 13, 10 to uh, 12 years. Um, and this is based on how, uh, how, you know, for how long you were able to capture um, the snow leopard in, in the camera. Um, so this, this is an estimate. Um, about the speed, I would love to know. I, I don't know. I know that people have um, in Mongolia and also in Nepal, people have tried to uh, put these accelerometers and uh, GPS collars on snow leopards. And maybe this kind of information we might uh, have soon. Uh, but it's important to, to, to see that snow leopards don't run on flat terrain, right? They can, you know, climb down and climb up at fantastic speeds. Um, and they are navigating in a very different landscape. They have these uh, very large 
pause pause size so that they can you know run on snow uh, very easily uh, they have very high they have very long hind limbs so that they can jump uh, uh, so much more than I, I guess a common leopard can jump so the comparison of their speeds is like comparing apples and oranges so i'm not so sure Sure, sure, sure. All right, no problem. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, the next question is a, it's a uh, sort of a broader question where someone hmm. wants to know uh, if you could share a few examples of how uh, ecological sciences have helped in the conservation of endangered species. Uh, right. So I think um, one example is that uh it it um if you set up these um grazing free pastures and the ungulate population comes back um uh, you know or increases then you have an example of um successful conservation right which is applied which is which this idea uh, the solution came to be only based on this um, research, this evidence from the research question, which is um, uh, that uh, livestock and ungulate populations experience competition. And by keeping these grazing free pastures, the wild ungulate population will bounce back. So that's that's one example from the um, snow leopard um, um, landscapes. Sure, sure. So this question, uh, Manvi, is about uh, the slide where you had she, uh, you, you had shown mesh on the top of the uh, cattle. So someone is asking if uh, it's correct to my understanding that the hole is designed to shield cattle from harsh winds. If the top is covered with mesh, could this potentially reduce uh, sheep fertilities caused by shock, considering the sight of a leopard on top of the herd might be significant threat to the prey? Have you uh, seen that the uh, death rate was affected in any way? Um, well, um, we cover it with a mesh and not a closed surface for ventilation, right? So um, I think people are working on better designs for the uh, corral, but we also uh, remember we have to operate in some of the most remotest parts of the world where, uh, you know, even getting to Kibber village, uh, the nearest big town is Kaza and that uh, um, is about one hour away, right? It, it, it's about uh, 20 kilometers away. And they need to get all the material from Manali, which is about 10 hours away. So uh, you can have an excellent uh, design, but to practically implement it, uh, not just in one village uh, or one person, but on a large scale, there are other uh, things to also uh, keep in mind. Practical implications. All right. This uh, brings us to one last question uh, for this session. So what is the biggest challenge that you face when uh, while studying these elusive species? In remote landscapes yeah i i actually want to share um, not just one challenge but also you know like a positive thing that uh, you know keeps keeps us uh, mot keep kept me uh, very motivated uh, the challenge was um, really working in these high uh, altitude uh, landscape where you know you need to, uh, to reach there uh, it's a three day, four day journey, right? And uh, uh, you have to acclimatize. And um, um, it's, it is very harsh, um, a very harsh landscape. Um, but at the same time, it what really, uh, I think, got me going and all the other team members going was the hospitality in, in these villages. It was these local villagers, you know, they say if you are in Kibber village or any village in Spiti Valley, you can just land there and not worry about your food and home. Somebody will just, uh, uh, you know, be the host for you. So uh, these endless cups of tea, coffee with the uh, mostly tea. 
uh, not coffee we'd have to take our own coffee uh, endless cups of tea with uh, the locals i think that was just uh, fantastic sure. can overcome all challenges yeah very nice thank you so much uh, manvi for such such an informative session and i think we have covered most of the questions and uh, thank you so much for sparing time out and we have a few announcements to make so please feel free to log out but thank you so much for joining us today uh, thank you it was uh, my pleasure uh, i had a very nice time thanks yukti thanks so much and thanks everyone thank you so uh, before we wrap up the session uh, we would really appreciate it if you could please take a couple of minutes to share your valuable feedback with us the link to the feedback form is provided to you in the chat box please note that the recording of this session will be available on ashoka's youtube channel so uh, you uh, can share it with your friends and family whenever you feel like uh please note that the ashoka uh, university also offers young scholars program uh, this is a residential on campus summer program for 9 to 12 graders we offer two programs specifically for the sciences ysp advanced for science and ysp advanced for computer science the applications for the same will open on 1st of december 2023 i would also like to inform our audience that the applications for the 2024 intake of the undergraduate program are already open the deadline to apply in round 1 is 22nd of november 2023 i would encourage students to apply soon and have access to personalized mentorship with our academic counselors interactions with ashoka students to learn more about the campus life and receive guidance for ashoka's holistic admissions process for more information please feel free to write to us at ugapply@ashoka.edu.in and this brings us to the end of this session thank you for joining us once again and please take care and stay safe thank you